Key number one is to start simple and start slow. You take it step by step and you gradually walk through the progression of enhancing and embellishing your music and your playing. In other words, if I had something very simple that I wanted to play, and I can take it one more step further, and I can keep working on it slowly. The same would hold true if I'm going to play a lick that I'm not quite at the place where I want to play it, but the best way for me to play it correctly is to start slow. And then I can get the desired effect eventually that I want. Key number two is what I call the three foundations. There are melody, harmony, and rhythm. You want to try to use all three of those facets in your compositions and in your guitar music. For example, if I start with a melody, and then I want to add some kind of harmony to that, If I want to put some rhythm with it. Another thing to try to remember when you're writing guitar parts, because they'll fit better with the bass and the drums or whatever orchestration you might have, is to not always be on the one beat, especially if you're doing multiple guitar parts. You want to try to use the guitar almost as if it was a, a, a percussion instrument as well, so I don't have to be right on the one. I can be in different places and it adds color to what I'm playing. So if I was to Playing right then was uh, improvisation, which to, is the key number three to me. It's the lifeblood of music, and it's it's uh, the process of realizing that and, and acknowledging that music is a gift and it is available to all musicians. So, cultivating the ability to improvise is extremely important, and we have to, we work on the ability to receive that gift by simply listening to our own creative impulses. You use your own intuition and you learn to listen before you're always broadcasting what you want to play. You, you stop and just listen to your own intuition. It's a very uh, important navigational tool to you know, play more meaningful solos as well as compose better. And if you listen to Jimi Hendrix or Duke Ellington, Bach, Mozart, anybody, you can hear improvisation as the tool that they use to create their compositions. So a song that I might have had simply by improvising, I, I was sitting around, I just... And then I'd go, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm working through C, sharp, A, and, and then all of a sudden I start coming up with a shuffle beat. And that would eventually lead into a song that I had called Trademark.
Key number four is chords. I like to approach chords as a group of combined melodies, as if they were multifaceted in a supporting form to create one big cluster of uh, rhythm. So you can move around these melodies from inside the chord. And you can start very simple. If I had simply a G chord, and then say I wanted to make it a, a major seventh, maybe I wanted to add a sixth in there, and then maybe I wanted to put a nine. Now I could change that same chord to a C chord by simply adding a C and the root would not be the one, but I'd end up with this chord like, which is a very interesting chord that simply came by taking step by step from a G chord. And you can do that with any kind of chord that you set up. If I set up like a, a I raise to the second. I raise the third to a fourth. I put a third in the bottom. If I wanted to put a uh, major seventh in it, or if I wanted to even put a sixth in it. flatten and sharpen any of those. As you can see by this, I'm moving around melodies inside of the chords, which creates all the different variations of them and all the different configurations. So you can, uh, I like to use a pick finger combination when I do that. That's usually how I play rhythm. Another version I like to use is more of kind of a Hendrix version where I might And that's basically using more of just all the pick. Another version I like to do is where it's more Keith Richards type thing where it's just more I'd like to talk also about voicing chords. A lot of times I like to skip strings to use uh, more of a wide interval like you would on piano. It creates interesting chords. So instead of playing an A, or even an A second, I might voice it like. So this can be done by just moving around the third and the fifth, 
are the root note as well. And you just skip strings in between. Another thing that I like to do is not necessarily use the root of the chord on the bottom of the string. In other words, if I had an A chord, I might put the third on the bottom. Or I might put the fifth. Or I could put any other manner of note that I wanted to add to the chords, such as if I wanted to add a sixth, it would be F sharp. I could put that on the bottom. R top. I could do a seventh. that I want to add, or if it was just the one, three, five, they can go on the bottom so that it gets me off the root to make the chord a little bit more interesting. And any extra note I want to add obviously can be moved around anywhere. If you have a ninth, you could move it around to the octave lower. And then you can always flatten certain notes or sharpen them. Once again, it's to just let all the chords move around with all the melodies that are happening within the chord. I'd like to talk a little bit also now about harmonics, which I like to use in my chordal work, which is basically um, you create a overtone of the string at the 12th fret, as is such as. Now, I also could do that with my right hand without even using my left hand by just simply using my finger to make the fretted. Uh, without fretting it, but right above the fret, and then I would use my thumb behind it to pluck the note. And then if I was to go ahead and bar the string and just go up 12 frets, I could do the same thing. And then I can start making it more interesting by making certain chords, and certain ones I might create a harmonic, and the other ones I might let go ahead and just ring out as a regular chord, but once again using my right hand to do all the picking, so it would be... I could also pull off notes. You can use these harmonics as creating as a succession into another part. In other words, if I wanted to... I could also... This technique of harmonic playing where it's kind of like a harp is one that Lenny Bro started years ago. And so I refer to it as the Lenny Bro style. There's also the Larry Coryell style, which I saw him do once, where he actually just, he does a couple of notes at once, and such as.
or you're simply using the finger again of the right hand and you pick right behind the finger that's that's uh, activating at the 12th fret such as and this technique is more of the classical style where you you pluck right at the the 12th fret so these are the main harmonic styles that I try to use in chords Key number five that I'd like to talk about is lead. To me, lead is finding that melody that's from within the chord. And you want to try to use the patterns and the scales only as a means to an end, so you don't necessarily get uh, bogged down in just patterns and scales. Uh, if I was to name two of the biggest factors in my lead technique, it would probably be the picking and the dampening. Uh, the picking I usually do is an upstroke picking, where the, the pick literally goes up from the pick guard. <laughs> By picking up, I'm able to get um, uh, the sound to bloom more and have less noise, and it, it creates a little thicker tone that way. It's a technique that I kind of learned from watching some steel guitar players. The other uh, it, crucial thing to me is dampening, and dampening basically, I like to think of it as almost like a mirror image of wherever you're not playing. So on my left hand, wherever I'm not playing, the underside of my fingers or the thumb is dampening what I'm not doing. And on my right hand, wherever I'm not picking, the side of my hand is dampening. That way I can keep it clean at high volume levels. time I'm playing, I have the side of my hand dampening the strings wherever I'm not, as well as the underside of my fingers. And it takes practice to try to work at that, and, but it becomes kind of uh, second nature the more you do it. So I'd like to uh, move on to other techniques I use where I might uh, uh, slide up to the note. Like Basically picking the note and then sliding to the fret that I want to go to. Another thing is stretching the string. And there's a couple of different ways that I might stretch the string. I might do it where I want to be in tune. I try to stretch the string so it goes to right to the fret in tune of where I'm trying to go to, whether it's a half step or if it's a whole step. Or sometimes it might be a minor third step. Another way to stress the string is by the use of semitones, which you can hear in blues players. Semitone means you're not stretching all the way to the next fret. You're actually finding a place in between that's why it's called a semitone. So that stretching is actually just halfway.
obviously this will give a blues flavor to your playing, but it also gives character to it and can be used in other styles as well. Another uh, technique that I like to use sometimes is I'll actually bend the note and then pick the note. Like if I went... Or like... What I'm actually doing is stretching the string, picking the note, and then letting the string down. This is just one of the many flavors that you can use to add personality to your playing. Another one, obviously, is vibrato, and there are several different types of vibrato. There's uh, the regular style that I like to use, which is kind of a wide throw to it, like... One of the prettiest vibratos in uh, modern guitar uh, is Eric Clapton's style, and he kind of used that wide throw type thing. Another style that Clapton used is where you just gradually rock the string, kind of pushing forward towards you from the floor. You can also vibrato a little bit just the other way, which would just give a light vibrato, like if I went... Using vibrato and stretching the strings with vibrato is something that you have to kind of work on. It, it's a, it, it takes a while, but once you get it, it adds another personality to your playing, which makes it a lot more interesting than just having the note generically be there. And there are different types of vibrato, as, as obvious. And then there's also the classical style, which is more where you, you leave your finger fretted on the fret and you just rock it back and forth. <laughs> This technique is just to give a little bit of flavor to the note without even hearing much of the of vibrato. Once again, I also use harmonics in my uh, lead playing. Um, most of what I do is where I'll actually use the side of my thumb 12 frets up usually, or maybe even 24 frets up, and then I pick right behind it. So if I was to, and that way I can... If you can get a close-up of this, it's... Actually, the side of my thumb makes the connection at the 12th fret, and then I just use the pick right behind it to create the sound. I also like to use a technique I call slap harmonics, where I might just slap at the 12th fret. basically doing is just hitting the string hard with one of my fingers at the 12th fret right above wherever I'm fretting. I can also use the pick if I wanted to create the classical style harmonic but using a pick as well. And that's roughly the same technique as using the side of my thumb, but I replace the side of my thumb with a finger and still use the pick behind it. And these techniques take a little while to get, but they can add a lot of flavor to all the lead stuff you do. And it's best to use all this stuff in a conglomeration as you're working through your lead patterns. 
Another thing that's very helpful to me is passing tones. They help alleviate stock positions. If I was playing a stock position, say, and I want to put a passing tone in, by passing tone, I mean a note that is not necessarily, it's not a dominant note, it's more of a recessive note as, as, as you're using as a hinge to go to the next note that you're going to. In that, in that way, the passing note could almost be any note of the scale. For example, I could get away with notes you wouldn't think I would be able to. Like if I... Basically playing through any of the notes, as long as they're recessive and you're not hanging on them, they're just simply a hinge and they can work well to like connect different patterns. Another thing I like to do is uh, string skipping for the, uh, to create a, a more wider interval lead voicing such as... basically playing the same notes that I might play if I was just staying in one pattern but I'm just flipping them into another octave and I'm going back and forth between them. And that can create a little bit more color to it sometimes. Another thing that I like to do is use octaves such as uh, Wes Montgomery because he was a big hero of mine where you use the side of your thumb and you just strike down on two octaves, or two notes rather, that create an octave. And I usually like to play the octaves with a string in between, and I use the underside of my finger to mute the string in between. So I'd be like playing. play these with a pick as I did in a song called Manhattan Another lead style that I, is really important to me is kind of the Clapton style from the old uh, Cream era. I uh, actually try to use a lot of that technique and that, that persona, so, say, in, in my playing. So even if I'm playing a different style of music or different chords, I might still play with that kind of inflection. <laughs> By persona, I mean I can take that kind of style and then put it into my own playing and play my own chords or play my own licks, but kind of use that kind of uh, attitude that, that Clapton used in the Blues Breakers, which I think is a, a beautiful style. And then, then there's the Hendrix style, which is more multi-notes lead kind of stuff where you're playing more...
basically I'm just trying to use a couple of notes at the same time to play lead rather than just always uh, referring to just one note at a time. Which is kind of the next section I like to talk about is chordal lead, which is something I've kind of been interested in lately, is trying to use more where you're playing lead, but the, the lead is done with chords. Once again, it's just another way of adding a little bit of a different interpretation to your lead playing. Another uh, important thing to do is to hold notes and sustain notes. You can create a lot of stuff just by... Just to create a different emotion is what that usually is used for. Section six, I like to call phraseology. And basically it's just a term to talk about connecting your phrases and your passages for flow. So if you're using scales and patterns on the guitar, you want to have ways to connect them to where they have more of a flow to them. And you want to use the scale and the pattern as a tool. And then as I was discussing earlier, you use recessive notes, for example, to connect phrases. If I wanted to go from, from a G pattern down here to up here, I might add some certain notes. Another technique that I like to use when connecting phrases is the use of open strings. They can be used as a convenience to help me get my hand position up to the next pattern. For example, if I was doing an, an E run like so if I was to slow that down in other ways to use an open string the same thing but a different pattern Another way that I like to use the open string is for just because it sounds different. Instead of playing... By the use of the open string, you can create a different timbre to the, the tone right there. You can just use it as any kind of coloration to change up what you're trying to say emotionally or with whatever personality you're trying to convey with it. Sometimes I like to use a one finger grace note during lead just to add to the lead. Instead of playing, I might put a single finger in. So you can notice 
notice this on the right hand, it kind of changes the tone a little bit. Once again, just to add a different kind of effect. Different strings can be used for different tone as well. I might play a passage like, or I might play it on different strings, and we'll have a, a completely different sound. So I can utilize that to my favor, depending on the kind of emphasis or the kind of uh, tone that I want to use. Those are the same notes being played just on different strings and obviously the, the higher the string you're going to get a punchier sound and the others will be a thicker more mellower tone depending on the, the type of effect you want. And, str and string skipping again is a tool I use for phrase connection. <laughs> Section 7 is an important one for me. It's listening to and editing yourself. And that's basically the way that I come to terms with what I'm actually playing versus what I might be dreaming in my head or romanticizing. It, it's easy for me to uh, hear stuff in my head and think, oh, this is really great. But what's really important is you have to monitor and uh, see where you really are in reality. And the best way to do that is to uh, edit yourself and listen to what you do. And the techniques that I use to do this, first off, I try to be honest with myself. I try to take a discerning, honest look at what I need to work on and where I'm going and, and where I am. I listen to recordings of myself, either practicing or work tapes, etc. And it can be any kind of uh, tape system at all. It doesn't have to be a, a fancy one, but that you have the ability to, to hear yourself back and get an image and see where you are. It's important to me to be open to feedback from others that I respect because they can sometimes have a perspective that I don't. Another important thing for me is to monitor the audience response. If I go out and play a show, certain songs might get a better response than others. If I in tandem look at that with an honest look at myself and think, well, what is it that they liked, what is it they, they didn't like, I am able to take an objective look at my music and see where I might be able to improve what I'm playing. Another aspect of trying to monitor and edit myself is as I said earlier where you're refining a part where you might start with something very simple but through a series of progression you take it to where you want it to be and in this particular perspective I would look at it like I want to really go out on a limb with something and try something new but I want to gradually refine it by monitoring and be honest with where it is to where I need to get it to be so if I wanted to have some kind of just spurious chord, say for example, that, that was just like an orchestrated part, but I wanted it to be kind of uh, pointed and, and, and make a statement, then I, I might have something like... And then by listening to it and thinking about it, I might want to take it to a... Thereby, I would see it through a process. Point number eight for me is important. It's listening to musicians playing other instruments. That gives me a wealth to draw upon, keeping the guitar playing fresh by the sound and also by the musical content. It breaks down my conception of limitations for guitar. For me, listening to piano or stringed orchestral instruments and saxophone is an ideal source because the tonality of them is very appealing to me.
To paraphrase a couple of musicians that I admire, one being Jimi Hendrix, he said there was always a guitarist that he could learn from. Anybody that he might see, he was open-minded enough to know there was something there that he could bring away from it and learn from. To paraphrase another musician that was one of America's greatest, Duke Ellington, he would say that all styles of music are basically good, that there was something always to hear of merit in any kind of style. So staying open-minded is very essential for me in remaining a student of the guitar so that I can always continue to evolve. <laughs> Tip number nine that's really important for me is to always keep the guitar interesting and fun while I'm practicing. If I do this, then I'll end up practicing more and I won't get burned out or not want to. Also, then I have more to give and I take more with me when I go to perform the music live. Another aspect that's important to me is to choose carefully where I do draw that inspiration and encouragement from in my music. I try to stay away from drawing it from business success, proudness, or reputation are the opposite of that because those things are undependable and they're almost, you, you would call them like a limited fuel cell. It's not something that you can really uh, reinvest your, your uh, inspiration in. So I want to choose things that I can reinvest my inspiration and passion in. And that would be like connecting with listeners, um, seeing what I can play to move the listener or have an impact on that person. I uh, try seeking an improvisation to come up with something new or challenging or something that sparks me developing my talent and finding the joy of what I hear in doing that. Those are the real keys to something that I can really uh, delve into and get something back from. The last point Point 10 that I'd like to talk about is standing in your own unique light. You try to do what you do that's unique and your place in the musical world. Putting emphasis on that instead of trying to be like someone else or trying to play something that someone else might play better than you, whereas what you play that's unique would be special and only to you. Identifying and developing that and your own uniqueness and originality is a key. A number of styles that I copy, but then I like to reassemble them together to kind of try to make my own style. Ultimately attach to being creatively original and discover your own voice. I hope these concepts might help. Remember that the music is inside us all and all we have to do is learn how to dive deep and find those pearls. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.